Hi, I'm Antonio, a student of the Master of Science program, and I welcome you to this presentation, where I will tell you about the Fafilov Cherenkov effect. This is an outline of the content of the presentation. I will first introduce this effect, drawing analogies with what happens in air when something travels faster than the speed of sound. Then, to properly understand the nature of the Cherenkov radiation, it will be necessary to discuss the properties of light in regard to its velocities and how light is emitted from a charged particle when it travels at superluminar speeds. It will then be possible to address the effect in a more mathematical way, and we will look at the geometry and the energy emitted by the radiation. Uh, finally, we will look at some applications of this effect, which will hopefully show why it is important to know about this radiation. Let's start from the sonic boom. Um, no, not this sonic boom. This sonic boom. You may already be familiar with what happens uh, in this situation. When a plane travels, it emits pressure disturbances in all directions, which move at the speed of sound. At subsonic speeds, what we, what we observe is a Doppler effect, that is, uh, the source of waves is moving, and therefore there is an increase of the frequency of the waves it is emitting, in the direction in which the source is moving. But there are no uh, sharp increases, uh, sharp changes of pressure. When the plane travels exactly at the speed of sound, it means that it moves just as fast as the sound waves it is emitting. The waves it emits are therefore compressed together and interact uh, constructively at this point. So a shock wave is generated, which causes a sonic boom when it reaches our ear. When the plane travels at supersonic speeds, the pressure field it generates is confined to a conic region called the Mach cone. Along the edges of the cone, the wavefront interacts uh, constructively, generating a shock pressure wave that propagates uh, in these two directions, and which the uh, the wave when this wave reaches our ear again, it produces a sonic boom. We can see how the wavefront merge around the edges of the cone, uh, drawing the tangent from the object to the farthest wave, and noticing that this tangent will also be a uh, tangent to all the waves in between, and these lines will therefore represent the wavefront of the built pressure wave that is propagating. So that was for sound waves. Now we know that light is also a wave. So is it something like that possible also for light? It turns out that it is, and it is the Cherenkov radiation. But before we talk about it, let's appreciate it with a video. It's supposed to be dark. This is a nuclear power plant that is being switched on. The fission is being allowed to start. You can hear the countdown. This blue glow is the light bulb also known as the Fafilov-Cherenkov radiation, or just the Cherenkov radiation. It was first observed by Cherenkov and his supervisor Fafilov in 1933, when studying the light emission of uranium salts in water. Cherenkov then won the Nobel Prize in 1958 for having discovered this effect, while Fafilov died a few years before. This glow is emitted because something is traveling faster than light, electrons in the case of this power plant. The question is, how can this happen? I mean, is it even possible? Einstein relativity states that nothing can go faster than the speed of light in vacuum. To explain what is happening, we need to clarify some concepts about light velocities. Then in the last part of the presentation, I will come back to nuclear plants and explain why they show uh, this blue glow. Light propagates in wave packets because a light ray uh, contains different frequencies which superimpose on each other, forming a wave packet. 
For example, sound rays contain different frequencies and therefore colors. And we know that because the white light that we see can be decomposed uh, into the colors of the rainbow. Wave packets present two different velocities, phase velocity and group velocity. Phase velocity is the speed at which the phase of any individual frequency component propagates. In other words, it is the speed of the individual waves that make up the wave packet. The group velocity, instead, is the propagation speed of the envelope of the wave packet, that is, the speed with which the maximum of the wave packet moves in space. I think this is not always a trivial difference to understand, so let's help ourselves with an animation. So we, here we have two waves with two different frequencies, and they superimpose forming a wave packet. You can see that the green dot travels at the phase velocity, it is the speed of a single phase component, and the magenta dot moves at the group velocity, it is the speed with which the whole pulse propagates in space. You can see the, uh, that they differ, they differ in this case, but for light propagating in vacuum, these two velocities are the same and equal to C. C is the speed of light vacuum and is 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, meters per second. However, in media called dispersive media, light can actually be slowed down by the medium. This is represented by this equation, where Vp is the phase velocity of light, C is the speed of light in vacuum, and then is the refractive index of the medium. So media with large refractive indexes will slow down the phase velocity of light. Uh, for the Cherenkov effect, we will always only be interested in the phase velocity, because we are interested in the speed of the individual wave components and not the whole group. Bear in mind that this also applies to sonic booms, but in air the phase velocity and group velocity of sound waves are the same, so we never really specify. The situation of the Cherenkov effect is further complicated by the fact that the refractive index uh, varies over different wavelengths, so different frequencies of light will have different phase velocities in dispersive media, which is incidentally what causes dispersion of light in a prism. We will look at the consequences of this, but for now, let's make ourselves comfortable with the fact that in dispersive media, the phase velocity of light can actually be less than C, and therefore it's possible to accelerate a charged particle to a speed faster than the speed of light in the medium. This will cause the Cherenkov radiation. The, the particle can, however, never reach C, the speed of light in vacuum, so the Fourier relativity is never broken. However, in a dispersive medium, a particle can move faster than the speed of light in the medium, and this will cause the Cherenkov radiation. But why is there a radiation when a particle moves faster than the speed of light? According to classical electromagnetic explanation, which is the one I will stick to, when a charged particle uh, moves in a medium, the charge of the particle will induce a polarization in the medium, which will, as a result, emit electromagnetic radiation. If the speed of the particle is smaller than the speed of light in the medium, the polarizations that, that are induced will be orientated in random directions, and therefore the emitted light will interfere destructively, leading to a zero net emission. On the other hand, if the particle moves faster than the speed of light uh, inside the medium, the polarizations will be directional, and the light emitted adds up constructively into a coherent radiation, which is the Cherenkov radiation. We can grasp this better looking at the geometry of this effect. The geometry of the Cherenkov radiation is actually very similar to the sonic boom. Spherical light waves are emitted by the medium at each point that the particle passes at superluminar speeds. You can see that also in this case, all the waves have a common conic envelope, which is propagating in the direction shown by the green arrows. We have said that the Cherenkov radiation is directional, and that is because it 
can only be observed at certain angles. And these angles are given by the intersection of the direction, which uh, we, in this case are given by the green arrows, with the propagation of the particle. So we are talking about this angle, which we will call theta. Let's investigate this angle in a bit more detail. So, uh, so this is the particle that is traveling in the medium. We will draw one uh, side of the surface of the cone, and we will draw one normal to the surface of the cone. This normal will, rep will represent the propagation of the light wave emitted at this point um, uh, in, uh, in the medium, and will also be representative, representative of the direction of the whole Cherenkov radiation, which will be parallel to the normal in this direction. Uh, so we're interested in this angle, theta. We can easily uh, find it because we know that the particle will travel distance v times t, where v is the speed of the particle and t is the time of propagation. At the same time, the light wave uh, here will uh, be propagating by a distance given by c over n times t, where c over n is the speed of light uh, in the medium, and t is the same time of propagation. So it can easily be seen that the cosine of theta is given by ct divided by n, all divided by v times t. The t cancel out, so we're left with c divided by n divided by v, which is often written as 1 divided by beta times n, where beta is the ratio between the particle velocity and the speed of light. This one is the is called the Cherenkov relation or Cherenkov angle, and uh, it's great. It tells us the angle at which we will observe uh, the Cherenkov radiation. But not only does it that, it also tells us uh, the velocity threshold, because uh, we know that cosine functions exist only between minus one and one. So uh, for this ratio to be acceptable, b times uh, n, beta times n, must be greater than 1, which uh, gives us uh, a speed threshold, because if we look at this relation, we can easily see that it's telling us that v, the velocity of the particle, must be greater than c over n, which makes sense, because uh, if the velocity of the particle was not greater than the speed of light of, in the medium, we will not observe any uh, Cherenkov radiation. This also tells us the kinetic energy that the particle must uh, possess in order to uh, produce Cherenkov radiation. This is given by the relativistic kinetic energy equation, which is given by the total energy, which will depend on the rest mass, but also on beta, so on the velocity of the particle. Uh, at which must be subtracted the uh, rest mass of the particle. So total energy minus rest mass will give and will be uh, will give the kinetic energy. And the uh, kinetic energy threshold can be found uh, plugging into this equation the threshold that we found for beta. So let's see an example of this so it will be clearer. So we have seen before, a uh, video of a nuclear power plant being switched on. Nuclear power plants contain water as a medium, which acts as a moderator of the fission reactions. Thus, uh, let's look at the threshold velocity and kinetic energy in water, so that we can relate it to what we have seen. Water has a refractive in index of uh, 1.33. This means that the threshold velocity that uh, an electron traveling through water must have is equal to uh, c divided by 1.33. This is approximately 75% uh, of the speed of light or 225,600 meters per second. So this is the minimum velocity that an electron or uh, any particle actually must have in order to uh, produce a chunk of radiation. From this we can deduce that beta this is B over C is uh, 0.752, uh, 
We can then analyze the minimum kinetic energy that an electron must have in order indeed to produce Cherenkov of radiation. So this is the formula that we have seen before. And if you're wondering why we're using this one instead of the classical half mv squared, it's because uh, we are talking about particles going at very high speeds. And for such particles, the formulas of classical mechanics do not really apply anymore. We have to turn to the formulas of uh, the that are, have been derived in the theory of relativity, which take relativistic effects in, into account. And this is the formula for uh, kinetic energy in, uh, in the theory of relativity, that is for particles that go really fast with velocity comparable to the speed of light. M times C squared for uh, an electron is equal to uh, 0.511 mega electron volts. If we plug this value and the value we found for beta inside the formula for kinetic energy, we find that the threshold kinetic energy of an electron uh, is 0.264 mega electron volts. So if we look at the reaction, at the fission reactions that occur in uh, uranium power plants, we find that just one uh, the fissation of just one uranium atom produces about 200 mega electron volts, which is way bigger than the threshold kinetic energy for uh, an electron. This explains why nuclear power plants produce such sharp and characteristic blue glow when they are being switched on, because a uh, fissation reaction produces such an, a, a great amount of energy that is uh, more than enough to uh, produce Cherenkov radiation. And that is why they produce uh, that blue glow. Let's now look at another aspect of this uh, radiation, which is also very interesting, I think. That is the emission intensity and the frequency distribution. Frank and Tam are two physicists that elucidated the theory of this uh, effect, of the Cherenkov effect, in 1937. And they worked out the emission intensity of the Cherenkov radiation emitted on a given frequency. They found that the energy dE radiated at a specific wavelength per unit, pa unit length of the path of the particle dx per wavelength interval d lambda is given by this expression. In this expression, we find alpha, that is the fine structure constant, and uh, it is approximately uh, 1 divided by 137. We have uh, z, which is the charge of the particle for an electron uh, is 1, for example. We have the wavelength of the Cherenkov radiation that is being emitted. We have then the c, the velocity of light, V, the velocity of the particle, and then the refractive index of the medium. If we plot uh, this function, we plot energy uh, versus wavelength, we obtain a graph like the one shown uh, in figure one. What we can notice from this graph is that the emission is continuous and not discrete. It does not have spectral lines, like the light emission from an excited gas, but it's continuous over the wavelengths. We can then appreciate that the peak of the radiation is in the short wavelengths range. And we can also notice uh, that that must happen because uh, energy is proportional in this expression to the inverse square of the wavelength. So of course, as the wavelength goes down, the energy will increase by a factor of four. That is why, uh, in most cases, the Cherenkov radiation is blue, like in the nuclear plant. That is because uh, the maximum intensity is found in, uh, shorter, in the shorter wavelengths. Actually, the radiation has peak uh, in the violet or ultraviolet part of the spectrum region. But since our eyes are more sensitive to blue light than to violet light, we of often see it uh, blue. Furthermore, when the Cherenkov radiation is projecting onto a screen, it gives rise to continuous concentric circles, like the ones shown uh, in figure B. 
That is because the cosine of theta depends on the, refra on the refraction index, which changes uh, depending on the, on the frequency, or better, on the wavelength of light, as we have discussed before. In particular, it, uh, it's greater for, uh, for uh, short wavelengths. So if the index goes up, the fraction will uh, go down, which means that the angle will uh, start to approach 90 degrees, if you think about the uh, cosine function. This means that higher frequencies and short, shorter wavelengths will show a greater angle, a greater deflection, compared to lower frequencies. The use also implies that in the Cherenkov radiation, each frequency, each color, will form its own cone, although they're all contiguous to each other. Finally, the reason the radiation is not infinite, uh, it goes to zero at some point, as you can see in figure A, is because, uh, well, even though the, radi the refracting index uh, increases for higher frequency, uh, it will actually start to drop uh, to one uh, towards the X-rays, which will cause then the radiation uh, to go to zero. Instead, for uh, very high wavelengths, we see that it's the wavelength term itself that will drag uh, the emission, the intensity emission towards zero. I will now discuss some of the applications of this radiation in different fields to understand why it is important to know about it. In nuclear reactors, yes, I like nuclear reactors. So in nuclear reactors, nuclear fission reactions take place. And this reaction produces byproducts, beta particles, that are high energy electrons or positrons sometimes which move at speeds higher than the speed of light in water, giving rise to blue Cherenkov radiation, as we have uh, widely discussed. The interesting thing about this is that this fact can be used to measure the remaining radiation in nuclear plants that are being switched off, because the intensity of the Cherenkov light is proportional to the amount of nuclear disintegrations that are taking place. In addition, well, probably the most important application is the detection of cosmic rays and cosmic radiation. If high energy photons or cosmic rays, for example, from a supernova enter Earth's atmosphere, they decay into a cascade of partially charged secondary particles called showers. Due to the high energy, uh, they move with nearly the speed of light and Cherenkov radiation of course, although for a very short time. Since these flashes have the same direction as the path of the particle, one can draw conclusion from the spectrum and intensity distrib distribution about the charged particles, and finally about the cosmic and the gamma rays. Fortunately, Cherenkov radiations are not all involved in nuclear plants or high-energy particles hitting our atmosphere. Cherenkov luminescence imaging is a very modern imaging technique that is being developed in the biomedical field. It consists in injecting in the patient pharmaceutical radionuclides such as fluorine-18 or iodine-131, which are radioactive and emit beta particles which in turn will emit Cherenkov radiation. This radiation can be collected by a charge couple devices and converted into optical images. The radiation will have different characteristics based on the environment or on, based on the tissue it's coming from, which can be decodified, which will then allow a non-invasive study of the internal organs of the patient. Lastly, in particle physics, the Cherenkov radiation is being used to identify uh, particles by uh, Cherenkov detectors, because the velocity of particles can be measured by analyzing the Cherenkov radiation they emit. If the momentum of the particle is known independently, it's possible to work out the mass, therefore the energy of the particle, which can be identified. We have reached the conclusion of this presentation. 
The Pafilov-Cherenkov radiation is a phenomenon intrinsically related to wave properties and phenomenon. I hope I managed to uh, highlight its theory and uh, that to show that there are many interesting applications linked to this radiation. This is my reference list. I thank you very much for uh, your attention. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, see you in the next video.